All right, if you'll get your Bibles out, we are moving through the book of Philippians. And we are uh, we're going to finish out the finish out the third chapter today. The Epistle of Joy. So we're going to start in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. And this sermon is entitled, Striving Towards the Mark. Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I make it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal to you also. Only let us hold to what is true, that what we have attained. Brothers, join me, in, or excuse me, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject him all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, excuse me, I skipped into chapter 4. Let me reread the last verse there. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And brothers, this is the word of the Lord. I was excited to get to chapter 4. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray because apart from you we can do nothing. Lord, my words are, are futile and meaningless. Lord, uh, maybe we'll touch a memory, maybe touch a mind, God. But your words and, and your word, Lord, will, will touch the heart, Lord can transform, can prick a hard heart, can, can break up hard ground. And Lord, I pray that it would do just that. Lord, for those of us in Christ, God, I pray that we will see the crown of life set before us and we will strive towards the mark, Lord, as our, our Heavenly Father and a cloud of witnesses cheers us on, Lord, Lord, that we will focus on things that matter and things that are eternal. And Lord, we will not hold on to things that are passing away. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So last time we were together in the book of Philippians, Paul explained something very important to us. Sort of, in my opinion, which is, which is the centerpiece of Paul's message in the book of Philippians. That compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, all things are loss. This isn't some sort of well wish or some sort of like um, unobtainable sort of like uh, vision he's trying to cast. He literally is saying, listen, all the achievements I had made before, all the things that mattered to me before, listen, in view of Christ, look like garbage. Because the power and beauty of the God of heaven who came and died for us outshines everything. Now, many men see this, but a life-transforming view of this will will change everything about your life like it did for Paul. Like the trajectory of his life completely changed. Then he goes on to explain to have part of this resurrection that we, we talk about in church and that a lot of people like to talk about the resurrection of Christ. He's saying if you want to be part of the resurrected life of Christ, then you must also participate in his suffering and his death. This includes self-denial, Christian persecution, 
laying down your plans, laying down your path, laying down your hopes, your dreams, taking up a cross and following Jesus. Remember the words of Jesus himself in Matthew when he says, whoever longs or tries to save their own life will lose it. And you can pretend that you've laid your life down as you pretend like the path that you have laid out for yourself is God's plan. You know that only you know. But the truth is, is truly laying down your plans and saying, God, I don't got any plans. I don't, I don't have a plan after this place. I don't have, I'm not saying when you, as you start getting towards the end, you shouldn't make any plans or that planning's foolish. I'm saying at some point, you've got to come to this place where you're saying, I'm going to go wherever you send me. I'm going to follow wherever you lead. And it can't just be words you say. Otherwise, you're not really walking by faith. If you've never came to that point in this place, you are not a broken person. You are not following Jesus. I'm not saying that, that, that I know where you're going to go or what you're supposed to do. I don't. But I'm saying every person in here should pray a missionary's prayer. Lord, send me. Lord, direct me with an open heart and an open mind. There's so many of us that have this grand plan of what we're going to do after we leave this place. I'm going to get this job back. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. But the truth is, if you've never stood before God and said, maybe you don't want me to go down that road anymore, then it's because you don't trust God. And it's a scary place to be. It's a scary place to be. Maybe God isn't calling you to take that high-paying job. Maybe He's calling you to take a low-paid job somewhere where He can use you. Or somewhere where you can keep your Christianity intact. Or somewhere you can be a better father to your kids. I mean, I'm not speaking specifics here. I'm saying we've got to lay out our life before God and let Him lead the way. But here's the truth, brothers. Until you see the value, the surpassing worth of Christ, you will never do that. I can preach about hell, I can preach about blessing, I can preach about anything the Bible says, but until you see Christ as valuable enough to abandon your life, abandon it. Abandon it like you ran out of a house and someone walks in and there's, there's water on the stove and there's a dog and the TV's on. Like, why'd this dude leave? Abandon it because you found something so infinitely valuable that you had to follow it. That's the kind of way you have to see Christ. And I promise if you don't see him that way, that if you truly pray and veer into his word with no agenda and no intentions and just say, God, I want to know, I want to know you, he will show himself to you. So let's read through those verses once again, just to reacquaint ourselves with it. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 3, it says, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain resurrection from the dead. And from there we, we venture into verse 12, which says, Not that I've already obtained this, or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul's saying very lofty things. He's saying, listen, it's apparent I'm in prison because of the gospel. Listen, my joy is to forward the gospel. There is no doubt about where Paul's heart is because his actions, like I said last time, your feet to give an indication of the condition of your faith. You want to know where someone's faith is? Watch where their feet lead them. The actions they do show what they really believe in, show what they really care about. Where your heart is is where your treasure is. So there's no doubt that Paul is, is, is a man who is actually living out the things he says. But since he's given this sort of lofty declaration about abandoning all things for the sake of Christ, and he sees them as rubbish, he also wants 
to be careful not to make these people think that he is saying he has obtained some sort of human perfection. And I definitely don't want you guys to get that message because a person who hears the message of human perfection will be defeated. It is a self-defeating message. People who preach that they are perfect are trying to set themselves up as, as some sort of hero or some sort of martyr for you to revere. There's only one perfect person. His name is Jesus. And so Paul says, listen, I'm going to talk a lot in the next part of this letter about what it really looks like to strive towards the mark, to, to bear fruit, not to ride the fence, not to be lukewarm, but to be about my father's business. But I also want you to know that I'm saying I haven't obtained perfection. And he's going to kind of give an, understand, an understandable sort of example of this. So, so there's a lot of times that people say, hey, listen, don't worry. God don't want you to, to do this or that. He just loves you and however you are is fine. No, definitely not. That is not what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, if you are a lost sinner, you're going down one road. And when you meet Christ, you go down a new road. You exit a broad road onto a narrow path. But that doesn't mean that you'll never fail or fall. He's going to give a, a real rigid sort of example of what he's talking about, though. So Paul has this dramatic experience where his entire life changes. We talked about that last time we were together. And he realizes who Jesus truly is. And this revelation completely changes the trajectory of his life. To the point where now he's being in prison for the gospel he was once persecuting. But Paul reminds us that the effort that he's expending also has focus. We talked a little about this before, but being sincere isn't enough. You can be sincerely wrong. You can run really hard and really fast down the wrong road. Paul's saying we got to make sure that we're on the right road, that our focus is intact. And we do this by the Word of God. We do this by making sure that our worship is pleasing to God, that the gospel we believe in is from God, that we're bearing fruit according to what the Bible says that means. So it's not this excuse to go sin, because if you use grace as an excuse to go sin, it's an indication that you are not a Christian. We're talking about striving for the mark, but falling short. And he uses the example of an athlete. A few years ago when I was in Greece, I did a teaching in front of a place called the Pantheatic Stadium. And the Pantheatic Stadium is sort of the precursor of the Olympic Stadium. The Pantheatic Games was sort of Athens' version of the Olympic Games that, that started a few hundred years before the Olympics did. And these games have been going on for years. And even like today, which is currently going on, the Olympics, he uses the example of an athlete to explain what this sort of striving looks like. Paul himself is saying that he isn't perfect and he falls short but the direction he is running has changed and that he must press on towards the goal. Like everything in his life is about getting to that goal. Every Listen, if he falls down, if he gets tired, if he gets weary, it doesn't matter. When he gets back up, he's heading towards that goal because that goal is a treasure. That goal is everything to him. He isn't running the race set before him, though, to obtain God's love or to obtain God's favor or to obtain salvation. He is running towards the mark because he has obtained the love of God, because he has obtained the favor of God, and because he has obtained salvation. It's, it's called, in Hebrews, there's a sort of tension between striving towards the mark and resting in, in the love and the grace of God. And, and the way, you know, you hear people sometimes say, do, do, do. And you have some people say, don't do anything. God wants you to rest. No, the truth is we strive because we have rested in God. I have been arrested by the grace of God. I am resting in the sureness that I belong to Him. And because of that, I am striving forward with all of my might. And I want everybody to know, not because I'm bragging or like I'm trying to put on a show. I want everybody to know where I'm going. And what I'm doing, because I want you to come too. And not because I'm perfect, but because we're running towards the one who is perfect. 
But I don't have a problem saying this, just like Paul does. I'm not perfect, but imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's a bold statement. But someone leading you should be able to say that. Because we're all subject to this. We all have the rules. We all, we all know the truth. Or at least we're able to. He isn't running the race set before him to obtain God. He's running it because he has obtained God. And because he is obtaining God. Let me tell you about salvation. Sometimes we talk about we will be saved or we are saved. It's not a perfect example, but I like to give it just so you can, you can kind of understand what salvation is, what it looks like. And some people have a problem with this particular analogy because of a few theological points, but I think it serves the purpose. It's like you're in sea and you're floundering around and you're about to drown in the ocean and you're going to die because the water and the waves and all of a sudden at some moment a speedboat pulls up he says, get in and I'll save you. The moment you grab that guy's hand and he pulls you into the boat, guess what's happening? You are being saved. Right? That's a moment of being saved. And the entire time you're in that speedboat heading towards the shore, what is happening? You are being saved. And there will come a moment when you arrive at eternal, permanent safety. And at that moment, you will be saved. That is a very good way to think about salvation. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And that's what Paul's saying. Listen, those of us who have been saved, let's keep our focus on where we're going because ultimately we will be saved while we're being saved. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, Straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he's been called by God, and this is what his life's about. Now here's in what's interesting. Let's bounce back to chapter or verse 12 for a second. What does it say? Not that I've already obtained or that I'm perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Right? We don't, we don't strive after God to be accepted. We strive after God because we have been accepted. And no amount of good works is going to make you accepted by God. Your good deeds are like filthy rags. But uh, you've been saved by grace, not of works. But those who have been saved will do good works. My favorite way to say this is works don't save you. They are evidence that you are saved. So Paul in verse 13 says, Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Like a runner headed towards the finish line, he forgets what's behind him. Anybody here ever ran before? Listen, the worst thing you can do when you're running a race is turn around to see what's behind you. Are they coming up on you? No. You need to stay focused on where you're going. You need to just let it all go. You got to make it to the finish line. But see, Paul's not saying that, that, that we're, you know, if we, if we get beat by somebody else, we're, no, he's talking about just making it to the end. Run it like you're running a race, like you're trying to win a race, like it's important, like you want to get to the finish line. And he's doing this in sort of light of the Olympics or the Pantheatic Games, which they would have all known about in this region. Think about the athletes. I mean, I've said this before from here, but think about this 13-year-old girl who's a gymnast, who's doing backflips on this thing and swinging back and forth on this pole, and they're doing all this crazy stuff, and you're thinking to yourself, how on earth are they doing that? Listen, she didn't just get up one day and say, hey, I think I'll go play on those bars. No, from the time she was very young, she was in tumbling and then gymnastics. And then at some point, someone identified, hey, she's really good. So they started getting her up at five in the morning. She's doing a special diet. She's training for hours a day. Or what about a runner? What about someone who's, who's a runner and all they're doing is running a dash of so many feet? 
And they train for years and years and years. And they eat a certain diet and they wake up at a certain time. And they cast off the rest of life to some degree because they've got one fixated goal. Now Paul's saying, listen, I'm not saying you can do it perfectly, but your life ought to look a lot like that. I'm not saying you'll never fall down in the race. I'm not saying you'll always come in first. But if your life doesn't look like a runner in the Olympic Games who is striving towards that mark, who has cast off all the things of this world, who is waking up, who is dedicated, who is dieting, whose life, listen, is passionately consumed. Is your life passionately consumed? I promise you, if you see Jesus for who He is, your life will be passionately consumed. How could you ever... How could you ever not look at God with passion and love and gratefulness if you really understand that He is holy and you are a wretched sinner who deserves condemnation? We don't think we deserve condemnation. That's why we don't feel so impacted by the grace of God. That's why we joke around about it. That's why we say funny things about Jesus and treat it like it's some sort of joke. It's not a joke. The Savior of the world died for us. And that statement should do something to you. you should, it, it should paralyze you to think about that. If it doesn't, I'm not trying to play on your feelings. What I'm saying is, you need to. this needs to be reality to you. Like an athlete who has decided that nothing in life is more important than running a 400 meter dash with all of his might. That he's willing to get up at 5 in the morning and, and run and train and lift weights and time himself, and eat tuna, and not stay out late. All-consuming. This description is what it really looks like to follow Jesus. So he's saying, listen, no one's saying you're going to do it perfectly. And if you just started, it's okay. He, he talks about that too. He's saying, listen, this is for the mature. If you're a brand new believer... It's okay. You may not know how to tie your shoes yet. You may need some more instruction. You may need to stay pressed in with the trainers more. You need, you need to, but it doesn't mean your dedication level should be any less. This is a description of what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. Listen, following Jesus isn't passive. Following Jesus is not a hobby. Following Jesus is not lukewarm. It is all consuming. John MacArthur says it this way, Though Paul had not achieved spiritual perfection, he had the blessed discontentment that kept him motivated to pursue it. This sort of blessed discontentment. You know that discontentment when we play basketball and you're missing your shots? And you want to try a little harder so you can grab hold of the ball? or so you can run a little faster, or so you can win next time. That sort of blessed discontentment that wants to make you try a little harder, to lift a little more, to do a little more, to become better at something. Sort of just that desire inside of you. That's what being a Christian is like. And it's not because you're trying to earn God's love. It's because God's love has consumed you. It's because the, a revelation of the cross of Christ has changed you. And you want to spend your entire life making Him known, conforming to His image, being like Him, looking forward to the day when you can see Him face to face. Those who are at rest, here's, a, here's something I want you to hear. Those who are at rest in their upward call will strive with everything they have towards the mark. Someone who has made peace that this is where they're supposed to be. I'm not talking about Teen Challenge. I'm talking about in Christ. You have made peace with that nothing matters more than this. Those who are at peace, who are at rest with their upward call, and that is the point of their life, that person will strive with all of their might towards the mark. The mark to live a life of holiness. The mark to live a, a life that honors God out of love for Him. The mark of His kingdom coming and His will being done on earth as it is in heaven, in your home, in your life, 
in your job, the way you spend your money, the way you raise your kids, the way you, 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 you do your hobbies, the way you interact with your family. True competitors, true athletes set out to win every time they take the field. One thing you can't teach, though, you can't really teach someone. They, you may expose them to it, but you can't really teach someone to love the game. You can put them in there, give them a shot at it. Some people are going to fall in love with running or playing football or hockey or golf or whatever thing they do. You can't make somebody love it, but the person who falls in love with it, you, you ain't going to have to push them. They're going to push themselves. But we still should push each other. Those who are at rest in their upward call will strive with everything towards the mark. True disciples of Jesus will look like an athlete whose effort and focus and passion is single-mindedly focused on one thing, the prize, the treasure. What is the treasure? Matthew 13, says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he covered it up. And then in his great joy goes and sells all he has to buy the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who is, who is intent on finding a pearl of great value. And when, in, and when he does, he sold all that he had and went and bought it. Listen, this is what being a Christian looks like. It's like you found a treasure and it changes your entire life. It's like Paul on the Damascus Road when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? I'm the one you've been persecuting. And from that day, the trajectory of Paul's life changed. I mean, so much so that, 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 that he's been in prison now for it. I'm not telling you, you got to prove it to me or to us or your brothers. I'm saying, well, just be evident. Don't talk about it. Be about it. I don't want to be known for some stupid band I was in 20 years ago. I don't want to be known because I used to own a business. I don't want to be known by some club I used to run around with or some gang I used to be associated with or the fact that I thought I had some street credit or the fact that I was a successful businessman or whatever your story is. I don't want to be known for any of those things. I don't care what, you know, for me personally, what band I toured with or what little, you know, story I can tell that you might go, oh, I've heard of that person. I don't care anymore. I want to be known for the cross of Christ. Everything is lost. Don't you realize that everything is lost? You're telling the stories about the old days. Why do those still make you excited? It's garbage. It's all loss. I don't want to be known for something in my past or some band I was in or some patch I wore or some colors I flew or how successful I was or wasn't. It's all loss. Brothers, if it doesn't look like garbage compared to the value of Christ, the treasure that is Christ, then you don't know Him. And I want you to know Him. I want you to know Him in an all-consuming way. This isn't condemnation. This is examination. If you really see Christ as a treasure, then your old life like I said earlier, will look like a house that someone abandoned in the middle of night without explanation. They didn't even clear anything out. They didn't even take anything valuable with them. Either they got abducted or something so exciting and so valuable came by that they just left it all behind. They just left their house, left all their stuff. Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal also to you. Let us hold true to what we have attained. Now be careful with what he just said. He's saying if you are a true believer and you're not mature enough to think that way yet, God's going to reveal it to you. Because you've obtained something. Because see, listen, Christ, like I say all the time, is not only the author of your salvation, but he is the finisher of your salvation. So if you're a person who's struggling still with the past, you're thinking, man, 
That's good back then, but I sure don't want to think that way anymore. If you're like, it's your attention about it, it's okay. Maybe you're just a baby. I'm not saying I never fall into sin. I just know that it's garbage. I'm not saying I've never taken my eye off the prize. But I do discipline myself to have laser focus. I got to. I've been, I've been wooed off too many times. I've been lured back to the broad road too many times just to find out that the thing I was chasing was a mirage. And the thing that I had abandoned everything for was the all-consuming treasure of my life. It will never let you down. So let those of us who are mature think this way. And if you want to be mature, condition yourself to think this way. How do you do that? By getting in God's Word for yourself. Don't look for a blessing or for a cursing or for some ammo to argue with your brother about. Get in there and find out who God is. Don't you know the point of theology is not to get all highfalutin? It's to know God. And God has written a letter to us. This should be a consuming passion of our life. Now don't feel like you're not very spiritual as if you, when you start reading this book that you get tired and your eyes get heavy. Being a Christian isn't about doing what you feel. Remember, it's about denying self, picking up a cross and following Him. It's about discipline. I tell you, the athlete who gets up at 5 o'clock because they want to be an Olympic champion, that doesn't mean they don't have a day where they want to hit the snooze button or they want to eat some Twinkies or they don't want to go to practice. But they are the kind of people because what they are after has consumed them so much that they, they have conditioned themselves to say otherwise. Listen, brothers, don't ever let anyone tell you that Christianity has nothing to do with self-discipline. Let me tell you something. The word disciple is rooted in discipline. Being a disciple, the word disciple and discipline come from the same root. To be a disciple of someone is to be disciplined by the teachings of the master and to subject yourself to their teachings. Following the master. That's what being a disciple is. Being a disciple isn't a hobbyist. It's about committing your life to the person who is in charge, the master. You're the disciple. They're the master. Don't be surprised when, you're, when your flesh don't want to go that way, brothers. It's a fight. Don't wait for some good feeling to come over you and think that then you'll follow Jesus. The good feeling ain't coming. It may come one moment in prayer. You may have this moment where the Spirit of God moves and you're excited. But you're going to go to sleep and wake up the next day. And you're going to have to get up and strap your boots on again. And what's going to keep you moving is seeing the treasure that is Christ. If, you, if your faith is failing, gaze at the treasure that is Christ. If you start feeling sorry for yourself, think about the Savior who abandoned heaven to die for you, an undeserving sinner. That should be enough. That actually should be enough to get you through any trial in life. If you feel sorry for yourself, you have no idea who Christ is in that moment. I feel bad for oh, everyone forgot about me. Really? He didn't forget about you. Because while you are still a sinner, he died for you. Okay. If this description of a focused athlete doesn't describe your life in Christ, you are either just a baby or an immature Christian, which is fine. Or it might be something that you have not yet obtained. Because that's what he says. He says, let those of us who think we're mature think this way. And if you, if you think anything otherwise, God will reveal this to you also. Let us hold to what we have obtained. Let us hold to the truth of what we have attained. What have we attained? We have attained Christ. We have attained regeneration. We have retained or attained new life through the gift of God and the gospel. So either you're at the starting line of this thing and you're still learning how to tie your shoes and, and, you're, and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're learning how to be conditioned, that's okay. And I'm not saying that means you gave your life to God yesterday. Some people surrender their life to God and ain't been to practice yet. That's okay. Verse 17, brothers, join, me, join in imitating me. That's what Paul says. I used to think, man, how could he say that? But I want to live a life now where I could say that to you. Join in imitating me. It's not prideful. I hope it means that everything about my life is aimed at this. 
I hope that's what it means. I hope that's true in my life. If you're a Christian, I hope that's true in your life. You know, if you've been here for six months and you're living as a leader in this place, you need to have some dudes following you here. Because guess what? When you're doing wrong, you typically have some dudes following you there. People like to follow people that are convinced. The guy who's convinced, he says, man, we can go, we can get in that house. Nobody know about it. Come on, bro. It'll be a big payday. Come on. There's some, there's some reason you're listening and you're like, it's a bad idea, but I mean, this guy seems convinced. It ain't no different when we're living for God. Be convinced. If you ain't convinced, get convinced. Get in your prayer closet. Get in your prayer. I'm talking to believers right now. Those of you who are in Christ, get in your prayer closet. Single a dude out in this place that looks like he's on the edge of, of, of not even wanting to be here. Just seeming like he, he's not, nothing's coming through to him. Pray, God, give me a person to pray for. And start working on that dude. Be there for him. Love him. Encourage him in God's word. Be the guy that talks him out of when he leaves or is trying to go or when he's trying to run away. Dude, no, 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 man. Think about it, bro. Think about your wife. Think about that legal charge. Come on, man. Just, just hang out one more day. Just hang out one more day because guess what? You needed someone to do that for you at one point too. I sure know I did. Listen, this is what it means to love each other, to bear each other's burdens. But you got to be convinced of it yourself. So you got to get in God's Word. You got to be prayed up. Not just for the sake of others, for the sake of your own life. Brother, brothers, I have not obtained perfection, me, myself, but I'm striving towards the mark. This is my singular focus in life. It's more important to me than my family. It's more important to me than my safety. It's more important to me than my job. It's more important to me than my house. Listen, this world is not my home. So follow me as I follow Christ. And be other disciples who make disciples. That's what being Christian is about. Real disciples make disciples. Paul says, those of us who obviously have abandoned normal life for a higher call, people whose lives are in line with the Bible and the devoted, devoted followers of Jesus should be calling. Hey, brother, let's do this together. Come on. You say, you're, you, say you believe in God. Well, let's talk about it then. I know you're mad. I know you're angry at this point. Let's talk about the real thing, though. Who cares who's in charge of this place? Who cares what that intern said? Who cares if you go to prison after this? Listen, this is about eternity. People who love people do hard things. There's probably some dudes in here that have had some hard talks with each other. Come on, bro. Come on. Remember the other day when you were talking to me? I'm doing the same to you now, man. Get your eye fixated back on the prize. It's okay. It's okay to lose focus for a minute, but let's get, let's get focused. Verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, and even with tears, walk as enemies of Christ. So he starts off by encouraging these Christian brothers and sisters by saying, listen, those of you who are in Christ, we need to shift our focus to following Jesus, the person whose forsake we've lost all things, the, the, the person, the, the goal, the prize, the treasure that makes everything else look like garbage. Listen, follow me as I follow Christ. Let's do, let's do this. And the reason I want you to be strong in this because there are those that are going to tell you something different about Christianity. They're going to try to convince you one of two things. They're going to try to convince you that you can be perfect like them as they raise themselves up on some sort of holy platter. They're going to tell you, God ain't too worried about how you live your life. You said the prayer, right? God wants you to be happy. Do you, man? It, didn't, it don't matter if you live with that girl. You're not married to her. It don't matter. You're allowed to have a little fun on the weekend. Listen, that person has no interest at what lies at the end of this road. That person is some, someone of a depraved mind who has been robbed of the truth, who is trying to convince you to follow them down the broad road. And Paul doesn't say this arrogantly. It says, 
I've told you this many times before, and I now tell you, even with tears, many walk as enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is what we're talking about. That's what Christianity is about, the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul tells the Philippian Christians to follow his lead and other devoted pastors and Christians who preach and live their lives as if Christ was a treasure worth abandoning everything for. But then he warns them that there are people, and he gives them examples of people who invoke the name of Christ, but who are actually enemies of the cross of Christ. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? You know, we like to think about some sort of heathen who's holding his fist up in the air. Ah, Jesus. But I said this before in a message that I preached a while back. Remember that Jesus rebuked Peter also. Anything that stands in the way of the cross is an enemy of Christ. Any version of Christianity that is void of self-sacrifice and a cross is a false Christianity. Any version of Christianity that doesn't call sinners to repentance and to Christians to live in holiness to a holy God is a wicked deception. Matthew 7.13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. This is Jesus talking. He's saying, you want to follow me? Listen, you, you, you want to know how you know the road is really my road? It's the one I've walked down. It's going to look the same. It's going to be jagged. It's going to be hard. You're going to be carrying a cross. It's going to be exclusive because it's only the way that I have laid out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Enter through the narrow gate. And then right after this in Matthew 7, 15, he says, Because beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. See, there's going to be people who are standing by the narrow gate and saying, listen, you don't got to go down that way. Stay over here with us, man. We love Jesus too. We love Jesus and some and a little beer, a little weed. Some girls telling you, hey, man, I, I don't do drugs. It would be a lot cheaper if we, if we lived together, though. We save some money. You don't want the truth? This is the truth. Listen, beware of false prophets. They are ravenous wolves dressed in sheep clothing. And here's the sad part, brothers. There are preachers standing in pulpits today that are telling you the broad way is the right way. Go with the flow. Go with the crowd. But don't listen to my words. Listen to Jesus. Narrow is the gate. Only a few are going to find it. Listen, if you're going with the flow and with the masses, that might be room for concern. Being a Christian isn't about fitting in. It's not about being respectable. It's not about being important. It's about coming into contact with something that is so supremely powerful, so supremely important that nothing else matters. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Listen, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered with thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. Paul doesn't say this arrogantly back to Paul's text, but he says it warning them with tears. Because apparently what was happening in Paul's case is these super apostles or these false teachers are saying, look, Christianity ain't working out so good for Paul. He's in prison. He's su struggling. He's suffering. Look at us. G give your money to us. Come over and be part of our love feast. It's easy over here. It's not narrow. Verse 19 their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame with mind set on earthly things. We'll get back to that in a second, but isn't it interesting he doesn't say utterly wicked things. He says earthly things. 
your stomach, your appetite, your desires. They're in this destruction. Remember, wide is the way and broad is the gate that leads to destruction and many find it. Paul is talking about these people. Their God is their belly. Remember, we talked about this yesterday in the book of John. Listen, your earthly desires and your fillings will lead you to destruction because you have a corrupt mind and you have a wicked heart outside of Christ. Don't follow. Listen, people say, listen, do what you feel. Hey, fo follow your heart, man. I'm going to tell you, don't follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Your heart's going to lead you to the wrong place. Jesus says nothing about following your heart or following your feelings. He says, deny yourself and follow me. Go where I'm going. You want to know the right direction? Here it is. Sometimes you might feel it and sometimes you might not. Just like the athlete. Their glory is in their shame or they glory in their shame. People on the broad road glory in their past, in their sin. And listen, here's the thing, brothers. Not just the utterly bad stuff. We just glory in worldly things. We glory in, and listen, even the world itself today, they glory and take pride in every depraved thing. Look at pop culture today as it glorifies itself in the shame of sin. It's not saying, hey, listen, we're doing what's wrong over here in the corner. It's like, look at us. Let's have a parade. Woo, wickedness. And the world goes, well, I don't want to be unloving. They glory in their shame, and their end will be destruction. Sexual promiscuity, homosexuality, greed, self-centeredness, all these things make us enemies of the cross. Enemies of the cross. Here's another list that, that gives us an idea of what enemies of the cross look like. You can turn over there if you want. Second Timothy, if I can get there. Second Timothy, chapter 3. But understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having an appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. You may not like all those things I just said, but there's many things in that list that our culture will hold on a flag and wave. Greed? How about lover, being a lover of self? We think it's funny, but disobedient to parents? You watch any show on Nickelodeon today, and it's got a, it's got a story about some really smart kids and some idiot parents who just can't even figure anything out. We're, our kids are bred for disrespect from a very young age. And we wonder why, and you may think this is ridiculous, they wander into high schools with automatic weapons and shoot 15 or 20 people. From a very young age, we tell them that they are the Lord of the house. We idolize them. We give them whatever they want. We don't correct them. We don't lead them. We're scared that they'll be mad or they won't like us. We try to make up for past sins by not being their authority, not teaching them right from wrong. And we'll stand accountable for God one day for that too. Their minds are set on earthly things. How about this? Not even necessarily evil things, but worldly things. Remember, this is why Jesus rebuked Peter in Matthew 16. Because he stood opposed to the cross of Christ. Because his mind was set on earthly things. You know, there's some of you here that aren't plotting evil or going back to your old life, you know why your problem is here? Is your mind is set on earthly things. Just earthly things. You're not really terribly concerned with surrendering control of your life to God. You just want to do you. And you want to be able to do it sober maybe. Earthly things. Earthly things. Every little situation in your life, earthly things. 
Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it for you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, Listen, if anyone would wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up a cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Until you realize that following Christ is more important than every situation in your life, then you're not following Christ like a disciple. You're following Christ like Peter and John were in the beginning when they were hoping Jesus was going to make them great. They could be on his right and left as he overthrew Rome. They were real disappointed to find out that he didn't come to be uh, an earthly king, that he came to die for the sins of men, but obviously in the resurrection, they got it. Until you realize that following Christ is more important than every situation in your life, and hear me, brothers, until you realize that you are set on earthly things and you are an enemy of the cross. Any sort of Christianity that isn't focused on the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ, that is an enemy of the cross. Any form of Christianity that is about self-empowerment rather than self-denial is an enemy of the cross. Anyone who puts human concerns above the concerns of God and His kingdom is an enemy of the cross. So you say, what about me? Does God not care about me? Oh, sure God cares about you. That's why God says this. Therefore I tell you, Matthew 6, 25, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Isn't life more than food? Isn't your body worth more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They never sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to the span of your life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God closes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow and then thrown into an oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So if you ask the question, doesn't God care about me? Here's the answer. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then He will add these other things to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I know this that many of you know this, but the thing that you are so anxious about here, the human concerns that you have, you have made the Lord of your life, this one situation... If this don't get solved, I'm leaving. If this don't get solved, this, the God ain't real. And God's saying to you, listen, if you seek first my kingdom, that's what faith is. You're actually putting your trust in him. Jesus says, listen, if you don't come to me like a little child, you have no place in my kingdom. We got to trust him. We got to abandon control of our life and believe not only in the greatness of God, but also in the goodness of God. We're almost done. Verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. So brothers, sisters who are in Christ, here is our hope. If you see Christ as a treasure and you have abandoned this world and the concerns of man for the glory of God, if you are living as a pilgrim and an exile in this world, then take heart. Your citizenship is in heaven. 
And we are working and waiting on a Savior. And our blessed hope is, is when our Savior returns, He will set all things right. He will transform our lowly, broken, crooked, sin-filled members into a glorious body. But here's the thing, brothers. If you're not really convinced about that, then it doesn't matter because you're going to be concerned about what's going on in the here and now. If you're not really thinking that the second you close your eyes and draw your last breath, that you'll be standing before God, that 80 years is very short, or many of us won't, won't live to see 80 years. Many of us will die at 40 and 50 and 60. We don't know when that day is coming, but if you're completely convinced that the treasure of the world has called you and drawn you up to an upward call, then all we're doing is moving forward towards that line like exiles. What are you trying to build a house? Why are you trying to repair your old broke down house? Trust him. He's saying, listen, this is what we're living for. And by the way, while you're here, I'm also going to take care of you. But it doesn't happen when you go, if you do this, I will. And I know many of us don't say that, but deep in our hearts, that's what we're really thinking. If you move this way, I'll follow you. God knows the deep recesses of your crooked heart even better than you do. He knows you. And that's what faith really... Hey, listen, if you don't believe in God, then then what I'm saying to you may sound insane. But if you claim to believe in God, it's going to take faith to follow Him. In this place here... This is just a proving ground. The real battle's out there. The light, it's out there. It's waiting for you. All the stuff's still there. All the pretty sin, all the fish hooks with the bait on it. It's like, man, that would be good. I bet you I could get that off there without getting it stuck in my cheek. See, we even know the hooks in there now, don't we? We used to not know. We didn't know that the lure had a hook in it. And it took us like a day to pull it out of our jaw and it ripped our cheek apart. And we're so twisted that we look at it and we go, I bet you I could get it off this time without the hook. (laughs) Hey, I ain't ain't pointing a finger at you. My, My jaws are all scarred up. My cheeks are all scarred up. Because I bit down on that thing many times. Because I wasn't looking towards something that, that would never pass away. I was a Christian in word, not in deed. He says the blessed hope is that our Savior will return and He will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body. How? Through the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. The power by which He healed the sick and raised the dead. The power by which He created the world. The power by which He took a wretched, drug-infested sinner and transformed him, raised me from death to life. I couldn't do it. I tried. By virtue of His indestructible life, the book of Hebrews says, that proves He is a priest forever. That is, He he is our Savior and He is the King of all kings. Death couldn't kill him. He has the power to overcome death. Listen, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world, Jesus says in John 16, 33. It's not about this life, but the life to come. And if you're focused on the life to come to the point where you abandon control of this life, then God will take care of this life. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You know what that means? Seek first the kingdom of God and aim your life to be right with God. It's not about this life. It's about the life to come. That's why Moses, and that's what he was looking and living for. That's what Noah was looking and living for. That's what Abraham was looking and living for. That's what the prophets and the apostles were looking to and living for. Speaking about these men and women of faith in Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, it says, All these died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar off, and having acknowledged that they were merely strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But if they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they had opportunity to return, and so do you. But as it is, They desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. Here's the closing. Is God ashamed to be called 
your God. How, how do you answer that question? We go back to the scriptures and it says it is impossible to please God without faith. And we're not talking about your best life now mansion faith. We're talking about knowing that you stand justified before God on the basis of Christ and that God will keep the promises He made in His word faith. We're talking about saving faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. So if God is not ashamed to be your God if you have put all your eggs in His basket. Not that you'll never falter or never fail or never be weak or never grow weary while you're running, but that you will get up and keep moving towards the mark because you are convinced that there is a treasure at the end for you. A treasure, a glorious body, uh, free from sin. That don't sound too appealing if you love sin, but if you've been transformed into Christ's image, you hate the sin you once loved. And your faith is that you're living your life in holiness as you're walking and moving as a pilgrim towards a city whose builder and maker is God Himself. Is God ashamed to be called your God if you are an exile or a stranger in this earth because you are focused on the upward calling, striving towards the mark, as you live abandoned to the concerns of man and the treasures of this world, looking towards a city whose builder and maker is God Himself? The mark set before you, in fact, is your citizen and citizenship in heaven. It's knowing that you're a citizen. And I, I, can't, I don't have time to go into all of this because we really are at the close and we're out of time. But Paul was talking to people that understood the value of what it meant to be a citizen. In the Roman Grecian world, citizenship meant something. If you were a Roman citizen, you had rights. They couldn't string you up on a cross. They had to take you before a tribunal. You had certain living conditions that were promised to you. You had rights as a citizen. So he's talking to people here saying, listen, don't be focused on the people that are pretending like they're in charge for a few moments. Set your affection and your allegiance and your loyalty to someone you believe who is truly in charge because your citizenship isn't here. It's in heaven. And that's good news to people who are being persecuted for being Christians. And that's good news to Paul who is in prison at this time. And that's good news to you because some of you are facing immense worldly things right now. And the truth is, is, if you get a hold of that truth, then all of the power of that stuff will fade away. It'll fade away. And I don't say this boastfully, but I was scared and tore by worldly things too. When I came back for restoration here, I was facing 10 years in prison. And they told me that I was going to have to do most of them because I got my umpteenth DWI in the county where Mad Mothers Against Drunk Driving was founded, Denton, Texas. And I was thinking to myself, maybe I'll get two years in prison and this will be no big deal. And then they came and said, no, we're not coming off of 10 and you're going to have to do 85% of it. I'm like, what kind of insanity is this? And I came here and God did a work in my life. He transformed my life. And I'm not saying this to brag, but when I went, I'd already made peace. I was probably going to prison. I didn't even take anyone from Teen Challenge with me. I literally drove there to Denton, Texas, parked my car in the parking lot, called my wife, told her where my car was in case I didn't come back out, and I went there because they weren't offering me a plea bargain. The plea bargain was the 10 years. And they said, if you take it to court, we're going to ramp it up. And I, you know, when I first got in trouble, I was thinking, this is crazy. This ain't fair. I know killers that get less time than this. This ain't fair. But God did a work in me when I was in here. And I made peace with the fact that I was a citizen in heaven. And I said, God, I'm yours. And I worked here. I was actually working here for two years before I finally went to, to face these charges that had been lingering over my head the entire time. I'm not saying I wanted to go, but I'd already made peace in my mind. I'm going to go to prison. I'm going to shine for God. I'm going I'm to hit this, evangel this field. I'm going to keep my faith intact. I'm going to be a man of God in there. And I was praying up and... and, and, and not praying to God that I would be a witness in there and not fall back into my old ways and be one of the guys. And I'd given it up to him. And I'm not saying this is going to happen for everybody, but when I went in there and sat there to do a blind plea before the judge, my attorney said, come here right now and sign this paper. They've offered you probation. Sign it now. And I'm not saying that God had to deliver me that way. If it was his will, I went to prison, then it was his will. But I had made peace. I had surrendered my life to God. I said, I'm yours. 
I'd already been to Bible college. I'd already walked around and acted like a Christian when it was convenient for me. But listen, my faith finally found feet and I realized that there was something more important than being free or being married or being whatever, a rock star or whatever thing motivated me once in life. The glory of the Savior. And I wanted to shine for Him wherever I was. And it was God's will that I came back here instead. There may come a day where they put some of us in prison for being Christians. And I'm praying that, that I'll, I'll stand the test when that happens too, if it does. Is God ashamed to be called your God? And one day, listen, Christ through His Spirit, brothers, will quicken your mortal body and give you a glorified body like His. And to those who hold fast unto the end, listen, God is not ashamed to be called your God. For God has prepared for you a city. And as I close, I'll just say a couple more things. Not just the good stuff in your past. Not j Listen, God, it's good, bad, it's, it's over. It's garbage, it's gone. It don't matter what you did. It don't matter who you were, good or bad. If you were the Pharisee or you were the beggar. You were the scribe or you were the publican. It don't matter. It's all rubbish. The good you did before this place, the bad you did before this place, it's all consumed in the overwhelming, surpassing glory, forgiveness, love, and embrace of God. And all He wants is everything. He wants people who, who will focus in on Him, who will, who will run the narrow race with Him. God, I thank You for these men. Lord, I thank You for this message. God, I pray that Your Word was communicated. Lord, I pray that anything that didn't line up with your word, God, that it would fall from their memory quickly, Lord. But the words that are written in the sacred text, God, that it will pierce their heart, Lord, like an arrow, God, that it will be like a pebble in their shoe. Lord, for some of these men, I pray that this will be an encouragement that they need, God, to go and face tomorrow, Lord, that they will, they will join arms with other believers and say, we're in this, Lord, we're doing this. Lord, not just while we're here, but God, for the rest of our lives. Lord, to the men who are outside of Christ, God, I pray that maybe one of them, Lord, uh, would get a glimpse of your glory. I mean, I pray all of them would, Lord. But Lord, I pray that, that you would woo them and draw them in by your spirit. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.